Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We have um, a very special session today that is led out of our uh, regulatory science curriculum that Professor Karen Goff leads that teaches for us. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick hello. My name is Tara Sklar. I oversee the Health Law and Policy Program at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. Uh, within our program, we have uh, regulatory science, which uh, this class is part of. And we also um, have three other certificates um, that all could lead towards the Master's of Legal Studies in Health Law or be part of um, our JD program or other graduate programs. So we put into the chat just a link there about all the different courses we have now in health law at the College of Law, which is uh, just over 40. And uh, we also really try to have uh, regular sessions um, with national and international leaders in the field. And, and we post all of those on our YouTube Health Law channel. Um, and we'll be posting this one today as well. And there's a, a link in the chat uh, for that as well. So I encourage you to um, check out our programs. Um, these uh, webinar sessions are always free and uh, we very much welcome anyone to attend. Uh, in the future, we hope that they might potentially be an, a hybrid option where we have an in-person and a Zoom, but we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, we also really encourage you to join our health law uh, group or to um, ask any questions about you know, upcoming events or courses. So there's an email you can reach us at any point, um, which is also in the chat. Uh, so I really do encourage you to um, subscribe and be, and be a member of us our groups on LinkedIn or Twitter, or other ways that we communicate what's happening um, in health law at the University of Arizona. And then with that, I wanna turn it over to Professor Karen Goff, uh, who has been leading our colloquium series for the last two years. Uh, she's done an outstanding job in attracting both the leaders at University of Arizona and abroad. So I will have her uh, take over. Thank you so much, Professor Goff. Thank you, Tara. Uh, we're really looking forward to the, the talk today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as Tara said, I lead the Regulatory Science Colloquium course. And uh, I'm also director of the Applied Health Policy Institute at the College of Public Health. We are a uh, bridge between academia and, and policy as it happens in the real world and provide a lot of great hands-on opportunities for students as well as uh, policy work. And uh, we do, I do a lot of work with the law school and, and with Tara in particular. Uh, so I'm happy, happy to be here and the, uh, to lead the, the course. We always have some great speakers. So uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Doug Campos Outkalt. And uh, we are so excited. He actually contracts with the Center for Disease Control to assist the advisory committee on the immunization practices with their assessment of safety and efficacy of vaccines. So he will talk a little bit about how the role of that committee at the CDC uh, differs from what some of the other places that we're familiar with, like the FDA, what their different roles are in the process. Uh, Dr. Campos Outkalt is a senior lecturer at the College of Public Health here at the U of A. And he's also chair of the Family Community and Preventative Medicine at the Department of, uh, at the college, excuse me, the Family Community and Preventative Medicine Department at the College of Medicine and a clinical professor at the College of Medicine. And uh, he also has a wealth of experience outside of academia, uh, working at health departments. He was actually the medical director of the Maricopa County Health Department and uh, deputy director of the Arizona Department of Health Services. And uh, this contract work that he's done with uh, AKIP at, at the CDC, he's been doing for many years. And uh, we're just thrilled to, to hear about uh, your experience and everything that goes into the process. Just one small correction. I'm no longer the chair of the department. I was the, I was the chair previously, but I've retired from that. Position. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't wanna insult the current chair by <laughs> claiming to be 
uh, on that position still. But anyway, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. <clears throat> and I'm going to look for uh, Tara to give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk to you today about vaccines. And I'm going to talk to you about the regulatory structure that's in place. And I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, you'll have a lot, you'll have confidence in this structure and these processes. Um, and I think if uh, more people knew about them, I think that, that we would have a lot less vaccine hesitancy uh, than we do have now. Disclosures. First of all, I feel obligated to disclose that I spent nine years as a member of the ACIP, five years as a liaison representing uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians and four years as a voting member. <clears throat> After my uh, tenure as a voting member, I stayed on with the, C with the ACIP as a consultant uh, helping with the assessment of vaccine safety and efficacy, uh, which is done on every new vaccine that they make a uh, recommendation about. And it's, I'll, I'll describe these processes subsequently, but the evidence process where we assess the evidence, we use GRADE, which is an internationally known uh, way of assessing quality of evidence. And then we use an ETR evidence to recommendation framework, and you'll see how that works here in a minute. So what I'm gonna to try to do in the next 45 minutes is we're gonna talk about the FDA process for approving vaccines, the uh, surveillance system that is there for assessing the uh, vaccine safety, um, how this system has been modified for COVID vaccines, um, how vaccine recommendations are made uh, after they're approved by the FDA and where you can locate them. And we're gonna talk then about a compensation system we have in the US that compensates people in a no-fault manner uh, if they suffer a rare, serious, adverse event from a vaccine. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about how that system functions in the era of COVID as well. <clears throat> now, one year ago, <clears throat> I showed this slide and there were a number of vaccines in, in the various uh, stages of trials. And subsequent to that, we've had three vaccines approved for use in the USA, we've got the Moderna and the Pfizer. Both of those are messenger RNA-based vaccines. And we have the Janssen Pharmaceutical, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, which is a genetically modified adenovirus uh, vaccine. The other manufacturers have not submitted yet for approval. Uh, and they're in various stages of tests and talks with the FDA. And I'll talk about some of the nuances of what that might mean uh, in the talk as well. Here's the structure in the United States for vaccine oversight. The Department of Health and Human Services uh, is over all of it. So the Secretary of Health cabinet level position is ultimately responsible for this. There is a National Vaccine Advisory Committee, which is a very high level committee, uh, has terms of service and these are independent, usually presidents of corporations and national medical societies and so forth. And the National Program Vaccine Program Office, uh, which coordinates all the activities in the federal government regarding vaccines. <clears throat> in the Department of Health and Human Services, there are three major agencies. <clears throat> the first is the CDC, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about that. And they um, staff the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, <clears throat> and, we'll, and they make recommendations regarding vaccine use. The FDA, which actually is the initial step for getting a vaccine used in the United States, they have to approve it or license it. And then the Health Resources and Services Administration, which runs the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which I've mentioned and I'll mention again. So FDA approval. The FDA has a subcommittee, and these again are independent people who our university professors, researchers, and non-conflicted other folks who serve defined terms on the vaccines and related, related biological products advisory committee. We'll call that VRBAC from now on. And they review evidence regarding efficacy and safety. And they make a recommendation to the FDA regarding whether a vaccine should be approved or not. The FDA is free to accept that recommendation or not. So anyway, the, the Burback reviews and, and makes recommendations to the FDA. There's three ways to make the process go fast. First of all, is to just do everything as and just do it fast. Um, 
so the vaccine manufacturer does not get a shortcut, but FDA can shortcut its the time it takes to review it. The second is what we call an emergency use authorization, and I'll discuss that in more depth next. The third extended use authorization is almost never used. It's a kind of like a compassionate use where if a, a rare disease comes in, affects very few people, but we need to vaccinate some people to protect against it, we can get it approved very quickly. <laughs> All right. Now, if a vaccine is approved by an EUA, then it eventually has to be approved by the regular process, which we call a BLA, Biological Licensing Application. So what does an EUA require? And this is the verbiage, and I've underlined the most important things here. And, and in this case with COVID, we have a biological agent that can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition based on the totality of the evidence, whatever is available at the time, if it's reasonable to believe the product may be effective in either diagnosing or treating or preventing this condition and the known potential benefits and the known potential risks that the benefits outweigh the risks in the, in the eyes of the FDA uh, commissioner and the secretary of health, then they can approve it. Now, the fourth line is kind of interesting because this is, says there is no adequate approved and available alternative. And when COVID vaccines were first approved, that was the case. Now, the reason I say it's interesting is because I think we have a very interesting situation right now <clears throat> because we actually have <clears throat> another vaccine manufacturer coming forth with their product very soon. That'll be the fourth. And Pfizer has now been approved for adults, at least, with a BLA, meaning a regular approval. So I'm kind of wondering, and other people are wondering as well, is should we really approve any more COVID vaccines for adults under an EUA? Because in fact, we do have an alternative. I'm sure the manufacturer of this new product would not agree with my even questioning this, but I do think it's, a, it's being bantered around a bit as to whether we should do any more EUAs um, since we now have a routinely licensed vaccine, at least for adults, okay? So that's, I think, is a fascinating topic that we'll see play out. <laughs> now, at the time that this was all first happening, this was the last fall, and there was a lot of concern that there was political pressure to approve these vaccines with a, B, uh, a BUA, um, or an EUA, sorry, EUA, uh, too fast. And the commissioner of the FDA, at that point in time, uh, and the Secretary of Health said, you know, we got to do something to, be, to make confidence in these vaccines. So they set some criteria. Um, and they didn't have to do this. They set some criteria and they said, we want these criteria to be met before we approve anything with an EUA. Uh, we had to show at least 50% efficacy, meaning in preventing clinical infection. Now, the vaccines turned out to be much better than that. <clears throat> we want at least half the participants to have at least two months since they got the vaccine so we can follow safety for at least two months. <laughs> um, and we want at least 3,000 people in phase three. <laughs> and we want the efficacy data to be within certain confidence that intervals, meaning we have to have enough COVID floating around <clears throat> to actually test how effective these vaccines are. Now, I can tell you that pressure on this F, these two officials must have been immense because these conditions made it impossible for these vaccines to have been approved by an EUA prior to the election. And I can only imagine the pressure that was brought to bear on them to try to change this, but they, they, st they stood their ground. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on from the FDA and, uh, and the EUA and go to the ACIP, lots of acronyms here. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. <clears throat> the CDC staffs this. It's an independent group of <clears throat> experts around the country. Um, <clears throat> you have to be appointed by the Department of Health and Human Service Secretary. Nominees come up from the CDC <clears throat> and the secretary is free to 
accept those nominees, which they usually do or not, which they sometimes do. <clears throat> and then they'll nominate their own people. Last time that happened was under uh, George Bush, <clears throat> the second George Bush. And the CDC nominees were not accepted. Then there were three um, other people put on the ACIP that the CDC had not recommended. And that, was, that led to a very interesting four year period of time. <clears throat> now these are public meetings. They are, they are put on the web. Anybody can WebEx in and watch the meeting. Uh, you can attend if you get approved ahead of time. Security is really tight. <clears throat> so you have to get a security clearance and be approved to attend the meeting. But many people from the public do this. <clears throat> the meetings are attended by probably three, 400 people from the pharmaceutical industry, from the pro-vaccine crowds, from the anti-vaccine crowds. <clears throat> There's a lot of people there. <clears throat> Um, and the agendas and all the slides that are presented have to be posted by a certain time. The agenda has to be in advance. And time at the meeting has to be allowed for public comment. Now, all this is because the ACIP is authorized under what we call the Federal Advisory Committee Act. We call it a FACA committee, another acronym. And those rules are spelled out in federal statute. If you're a FACA committee, you have to do these things. <clears throat> All right, so the, I'll get, and I'll get to more of those requirements here in a minute. <clears throat> so the committee has 15 voting members. Um, they have a um, uh, one public representative who's one of the 15. You serve a four-year term. Every year, there's three to four people who go off and three to four new people come on. Uh, there's a steering committee that sets the agendas, and these are the chair and the uh, ACIP staff. We call them the secretariat. Um, and if, to be a voting member of the ACIP, you have to be screened for conflicts of interest. You cannot work for a pharmaceutical company. And if you're a researcher and you do research on any particular product, you cannot vote uh, when that product, if that product is being considered. The other agencies inside the Department of Health and Human Services also have representatives. So <laughs> Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Department of Defense, the, the VA, the FDA, HRSA, Indian Health Service, <clears throat> NIH, and the National Vaccine Program Office all have representatives sitting with the liaisons, which are representatives of national medical organizations. <clears throat> um, they sit around the outer table. That's what we call the liaison groups and the ex officio members. <clears throat> the 15 voting members sit on the inside table. <clears throat> All of these members can comment, ask questions, as can people from the audience <clears throat> after you know, when discussions take place. <clears throat> these meetings in normal times take place at the um, Harkin building at the CDC. <clears throat> um, this is the walkway up to the Harkin building. Right outside of your view here, it sees a fence. It's a tall metal fence. And uh, you have to pass through security to get in here. Now, outside the fence, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of people, although normally there's not. Back about seven or eight years ago, to get to the meeting, I had to walk through 200 or so autism, anti-vaccine activists and kind of hurling insults at us and other things. Uh, and once you're inside, the security is really tight. And I, I have always been very thankful that the security is quite tight inside the meeting. <clears throat> All right, so they normal times, they meet three times a year for two days. So I want you to think about this for a minute. I was on this committee for nine years. Three times a year, I would fly in the day before the meeting from Phoenix to Atlanta, <clears throat> get in late at night, wake up the next morning, irrespective of how the time zone you came from, the meeting started at eight o'clock, <clears throat> there would be two days of meetings and then I would fly home afterwards. <clears throat> that happened three times a year. Between the meetings, there's work groups <clears throat> and work groups consist of ACIP members, CDC staff and other selected national experts. <clears throat> and there's about 15 working groups at any one time they have to do with particular vaccines or conditions. For instance, there's an influenza work group. And they'll consider all the evidence about a new vaccine or, and they'll monitor influenza and they do a lot of work in between and they report to the ACIP. <laughs> and all this has, has provided staff support uh, from the CDC content experts. <clears throat> now, when ACIP makes a recommendation on a vaccine, 
here's the things they consider. First of all, the burden of disease. So what's the epidemiology? <clears throat> Age groups affected. <clears throat> what's the incidence? What's the prevalence? Uh, what's the morbidity, mortality, hospitalization rate, and so forth? <clears throat> and then we look at the efficacy of the vaccine. Does the vaccine prevent infections? Does it prevent deaths? Does it prevent hospitalizations? How good is that evidence? <clears throat> and we use this grade process <clears throat> um, to actually look at each publication, assess its quality, then we assess the overall quality of the evidence and we rank it one from, from one to four. One is high level evidence, meaning you can have a lot of confidence in it. Two, moderate. Three, low. Four, very low. And that just depends on how many studies they are, there are and how good they are. And, what, and it's a very objective process to come out with the ranking. And we do the same thing for safety. Um, they, they also look at cost effectiveness using um, the quality adjusted life year. There is no cutoff for it, but it is always reported when it's a new vaccine for a new condition. <clears throat> then they look at implementation laws, this practicality. <clears throat> Do people really want this vaccine? Are people willing to administer it? <clears throat> Can the system adapt? And what's the vaccine supply? On and on and on. <clears throat> Plus values and perceptions, <clears throat> which is getting trickier all the time because society is not uniform right now in terms of its values and perceptions regarding the vaccine. <laughs> now, if you go to the ACIP website, which all you have to do is type in ACIP and then click, <laughs> make, uh, if, you, if you're not fast enough, then it'll come up ACIP Prenza, which is some kind of Latin American news outlet or something. Um, and, and she ignore that and just type ACIP and hit enter you'll get to the ACIP website and you can see, um, they'll have information about the meetings and recommendations. And if you hit on meetings, oh, this, uh, these are members, uh, meeting information. If you click on that, you'll get the schedule of all the meetings. You'll, you can go to meeting materials. You can see the agendas. For past meetings, you can see all the slides that present, were presented. And if you want to, you can read 200 pages of minutes that were taken from each meeting. <clears throat> And there are people who do this. All right, so now we say ACIP has made a recommendation. They, they almost always agree with the FDA that it should be used and, it sh and who it should be given to, not always. They, for, they're free to disagree. And they're free to add groups that the FDA didn't approve for as long as it's not an EU rate. So that's what we call going off label. So FDA may approve a vaccine for adults 18 and over, the ACIP may look at that and say, yeah, but you know, there's this really high risk group that's under age 18 that we want to recommend the vaccine for. And they can do that if it's not an EUA. <laughs> now, once a vaccine becomes in widespread use, we have a vaccine safety monitoring system. And this is for all vaccines. It's in the, the what we call the immunization safety office. This is an office that's separate from the ACIP staff, and their job is to assess vaccine safety. <laughs> and they, they use a number of systems to do that, and I've got them listed here. The first is what we call BEARS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. The second is what we call Vaccine da Safety Data Link. I'm going to explain each of these here in a minute. <laughs> There's a clinical immunization, a clinical assessment group, and that's a group of experts around the country. I think it's like eight academic centers where there's specialists on call that will take questions from any other clinician around the country regarding vaccine safety and can it be used in this situation and that and so forth. <laughs> the FDA runs an influenza surveillance system of its uh, influenza vaccine safety influence, uh, surveillance system. There's the military. Now this, this one is little appreciated, but the military when it comes to vaccine efficacy and safety is terrific. Because first of all, there's no such thing as vaccine hesitancy in the military. <clears throat> um, you, you enter the military, you get vaccinated. <clears throat> and they keep great records uh, and, and they follow. So uh, vaccine safety. Uh, so if there's adverse events that are occurring, they'll catch them. <clears throat> and then we have the general medical literature. Lots of people out there studying vaccine efficacy and safety. Um, you know, a thousand, a thousand or more articles per year. 
Now, let's go back to these systems I just mentioned, bears. This is a, a massively misunderstood system. This is what we call a passive system. It waits for reports to come in. Now, who can report? Anybody. If you as an individual think a vaccine caused you an adverse event, you can call and report it. You don't call, you go online. <laughs> for COVID vaccines, people were given a, 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 an app for their phone. <laughs> and that actually became an active system where uh, they got, they were, people were contacted on a regular basis saying, how are you feeling? <clears throat> Have you had any side effects and so forth? Um, but VAERS is run by the CDC and the FDA. It, all these reports come in, and um, it, but it is not a proof of causation. It's what we call an early, early warning system. It's subject to a lot of biases. There's, it's subject to underreporting, obviously. There's a lot of people out there who have an adverse reaction that doesn't get reported. It's also subject to overreporting because people now who you know, operate on the internet and they let each other know, hey, if you have this happen, you should be sure and report it to bears. That's what happened a lot with the autism community. And, um, and so, and just because a report comes into bears doesn't mean the vaccine caused that event. It, it has to be studied further. So those who are expert at using bears monitor this system on a regular basis and they look for indicators you know is, are we seeing something that's out of line with what we would be seeing under normal circumstances and it's, it, it it helps look at hypotheses now for covid vaccines there's actually a list of suspected potential adverse events and those are checked on a regular basis are we seeing these reported are we seeing them in any high rates and and so it's 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 misunderstood because sometimes people will say that if something gets reported to VAERS, then the vaccine caused that reaction. And in, the, the truth is, many things get reported to VAERS that were not vaccine caused. Um, it, there was just a suspicion that it might have. Okay, so it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a misunderstood system and it's misused a lot. Now, if something pops up on VAERS as an, in, you know, some, some concern, <laughs> You can, we can now use the vaccine safety data link system. And this is a live system, eight large managed care organizations around the country representing about 9 million customers. <laughs> and they keep very good records regarding vaccines. And, and since it's an HMO or managed care organization, all the cares within that system, they can look for various adverse reactions. <laughs> so they can test any hypothesis that comes up through bears with an, a live and very fast assessment to say, is this happening in vaccine safety data links? Here are the sites around the country um, where these uh, eight HMOs are at. They tend to be around the periphery. Now, this system was enhanced with the COVID vaccines because of the phone app I, I mentioned. Uh, this. A, a, a potential adverse reactions of interest, which we was developed ahead of time and is monitored. And COVID vaccines are looked at every day to see if something is popping up. There's ongoing rapid analyses using vaccine safety data link. And then the FDA has an enhanced in surveillance system that they've contracted with some large um, healthcare insurance companies to look at their claims data to see if certain adverse reacts, events are being reported. Medicare has done this as well. The Department of Defense is monitoring their records very closely and the Indian Health Service has chimed in as well. So there's ongoing active surveillance. And I'll show you shortly some adverse events that were discovered in this system, even though they were extremely rare. All right, I'm gonna spend time on the uh, vaccine Injury Compensation Program. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now this is a system that was started by Congress in the mid 1990s. It was developed as a no fault system to compensate those who had confirmed or even highly probable adverse reactions <clears throat> that were caused by a vaccine. These are very rare events, but they do happen. <clears throat> and 
the theory behind this is let's not get into a bunch of lawsuits with vaccine companies because they, they're, uh, in spite of what people think, they're not the most profitable companies in the world. You can make a lot more money producing <laughs> diabetes pills or, but that have to be taken daily than you can a shot that you get once and then you're pr protected from then on or even two or three times. <laughs> um, we don't have very many vaccine manufacturers in this country. Um, I'm grateful for the ones we do have. Uh, and this system was put in place so that they didn't have to spend a lot of money on lawsuits, most of which were not meritorious. Um, the critics of this system say it protects vaccine manufacturers from, uh, from being negligent. I happen not to believe that. If we find any, through our surveillance system, adverse reactions occurring at any rate that's of concern, and I'll go over some here shortly, <laughs> a, a, a vaccine can be taken off the market. Um, and if that and that manufacturer will be scrutinized to say, you know, did we know about this ahead of time? And usually not. <laughs> These things happen at very low rates after the vaccine becomes in use. <laughs> now, the system, every in, everybody involved that likes it. The plaintiffs like it because they get through very fast, two years versus four, if you went through ordinary courts, it pays legal fees. Uh, it does not pay uh, contingency fees, it pays legal fees. Um, the lawyers who work in it like it because they understand it, they know it, it's dependable. And, and what happens is if you think you've been injured by a vaccine and you meet the criteria, there's some criteria as to how serious this has to be, you file a claim. And the, the uh, HRSA staff maintain a list of known adverse reactions to vaccines, which is compiled every five to 10 years by the National Academy of Medicine <laughs> and in, in collaboration with HRSA. And there's just certain things we know happen at very rare rates, but we know that they're linked to certain vaccines. If, you're, if your injury is on that table, you're compensated. <laughs> and the average award is about a million dollars. Now, if your injury is not on that, you can still claim it. And the HRSA staff then look at it and adjudicate it. About half the time, they award it anyway. They say, you know, we don't have this as a known reaction, but looks, this looks like it could possibly have been. They'll, they'll make an award in that case. If you don't win there, then you, can, you take your case to a court. And it's a special court in DC for vaccine injury cases. And these are judges who, who judge these cases all the time. And they're very good at it. And they know good scientific evidence from flimsy scientific evidence. And they can make a judgment very quick. And their standard is 51%. If more likely than not, they think this vaccine caused this injury, they'll make it a war. Now, about 10 years ago, there were three cases decided by this court, all autism cases. And some of us were pretty concerned about that, particularly this 51% ruling. But the court ruled against all three. And if you get the chance, you can go back and read those rulings. They're very interesting. And basically, the court was very strong in saying the plaintiffs in these cases had very poor scientific evidence for their claims. <laughs> and the defendants had much stronger scientific evidence. And that's the essence of those rulings. <laughs> so here's the injury table that's kept. <laughs> now, here's the, here's the thing about COVID. These, are, these were developed under a public health emergency law help funded by the federal government. They're what we call countermeasures. And under a public health emergency and, and a EUA, they are included in a different compensation program. It's called the Countermeasure Injury Compensation Program. <laughs> now it's the same concept. The thing we don't know is, is this system gonna be as plaintiff friendly as VICP. There's some concern it may not be. They have a shorter period of time during which you can make a claim. They don't allow for appeals. Um, and there is some concern that uh, the proportion of cases that are paid are not gonna be as high in the system, but we won't know until these cases are adjudicated. Now, when a vaccine moves from an EUA to a BLA, Theoretically, back anybody getting it from that point on should be covered by the VICP, not the CICP. However, 
that doesn't happen automatically. There's uh, several things that has, have to happen. First of all, the Secretary of Health has to include the vaccine on the VICP list. And then Congress has to impose an excise tax because the VICP is funded by a 75 cent tax on every antigen that's included in the program. So MMR, there's three antigens, that's three times 75 cents. <laughs> uh, if it's a polio vaccine, that's 75 cents. Now this system has millions of dollars hundreds of millions of dollars of excess money in it because even though claims are paid and they average about a million dollars a piece, these things are so rare that the, the system has tons of money that hasn't been spent. And again, that's different from the CICP. It's not funded that way. It's funded by a authorization from Congress so that we're just not sure how this CICP system is gonna, gonna work. Um, and in the VICP, as generous as that is, and as lenient as it is considering possibility for injuries, the, they award one compensation for about every 800,000 doses of vaccine given. And we know that some of those are probably not truly vaccine caused events, but we just don't know how many. How many. If we estimate that it's about 50-50, then you have one serious adverse event that merits compensation occurring for every 1.6 million doses. Now, when you hear people who are kind of not favorable to vaccines talk about this, they'll bring up the number of claims and the amount of money that's paid out, but they won't give it a denominator. You won't hear one per 800,000 vaccines given, and you won't hear one per 1.6 million vaccines given. <laughs> and you won't hear all the money left in the program. What you'll hear is the number of claims paid and the amount of money paid out. So I just caution you, if you pay attention, you'll see that. <laughs> um, all right, now this is a series of events that's taken place over the last year. And I'm not gonna go through it in detail. It'll be on the slide show, which I presume will be posted somewhere. But I'll just go through it real quick. Late last fall, we started having EUA approvals of Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, both mRNA vaccines. Pfizer for the 16 years and up, Moderna 18 years and up. And then Johnson & Johnson was in February, 18 years and up. The main difference there was a single dose and an adenovirus-based vaccine. <laughs> um, there's been a number of decisions since, such as a third dose recommended for those who are immunocompromised for both Pfizer and Moderna, six months after. It's now also recommended for Janssen, two months after. We now have boosters that have been recommended, 18 years and up for all three vaccines. Um, six months after the dose was completed for the mRNAs, two months after for the Johnson & Johnson. Actually, I'm not sure about that, actually. Okay, I'm gonna go on record and say I'm not sure the time of a booster after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, and then we've had EUAs for, uh, first of all, uh, 12 to 16 for Pfizer and then down to five. Okay, we'll soon have that probably for Moderna. And then we're gonna have boosters coming in for under 18s in the very near future as well. Um, probably starting with the older adolescents and moving down. And then we've had one BLA. That was the Pfizer back in August 30th, right here. And this was for adults 18 years and over. Now this is a routinely approved vaccine, no longer an EUA. And we've had hundreds of millions of doses of experience with it. All right, so what have been the results to date? <clears throat> Three active vaccines by EUA. In all the other results I just summarized, uh, the efficacy of these vaccines has exceeded expectations. If you would have told me a year ago that these vaccines would be 90 to 95% effective in preventing um, in, uh, illness, and even better than that, in preventing uh, severe illness and death, I would have said you were, you were joking. These vaccines have been tremendously successful and efficacious. <laughs> Safety's been pretty good. Now, I'll go into some of the details of what we have discovered here in a minute. We do know that for the mRNA vaccines, um, there have been what we call 
um, anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction at a rate of about, I think it's closer to one per 400,000, but just for argument's sake, okay, we, one per 200,000, one per, nobody we know of has died as a result of that. Hmm. We, had, we got a safety signal for Johnson & Johnson, and this was a very serious adverse reaction, central venous system thrombosis, brain a clot up in the veins in your brain or other major vein in your body, and low platelet count. Very unusual combination. <laughs> and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. <laughs> we also got a safety signal for Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA vaccines, myocarditis <laughs> in young adults. We've had no safety signal in pregnant women uh, or on the effects on the fetus and then newborns. <laughs> there have been tens of thousands of women now who've been vaccinated, no safety signal. As well. These are the results in terms of the community being vaccinated. 75 and over, you've got 83% fully vaccinated. Um, 65 to 74, even higher start getting the lower age groups, you have lower percentages vaccinated. And this is getting better all the time <laughs> through because of mandates or other people just you know getting on board or, or people realizing it's not really a good thing <clears throat> to refuse vaccine and then have your grandmother go into the hospital and die from COVID. You know? So slowly but surely, we're increasing the percentage of the population uh, being vaccinated. Not as fast as I would like to see, but it, it is improving. <clears throat> These are the 250 million doses of Pfizer, 150 million of Moderna. There's no reason to question the vaccine efficacy and safety of these vaccines anymore. <laughs> we know how effective they are and we know that any serious adverse events that they cause. And we do know of a couple. <laughs> Here's the first, okay? I told you about this thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. <laughs> And at first, this was occurring about one per million. Now think about that for a minute. Our VAERS system, which people criticized, and our vaccine safety data link was able to, conf we've been able to show that this is occurring at one per million, okay? <clears throat> now, however, once you start breaking down the age groups, it becomes very apparent that young female have much higher rates. All right, so women, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, they have higher rates. And this is, um, let's see, this is rates per million. So if you say they take the highest rate, 12.4 per million, that's about one per 80,000, something like that. Okay, that, that is much higher than I would like to see. And I think young women should know that because we have an alternative. They don't have to take an mRNA vaccine. <laughs> I mean, they don't have to take Janssen, Janssen. They can take an RMA vaccine. And that's what I advise uh, women in this age group. If I were you, I would be vaccinated MRA, <laughs> okay? Now, myocarditis. This is not as serious as the previous adverse reaction. This is an inflammation of the heart or the lining around the heart. It causes chest pain, shortness of breath. It does cause hospitalization most of the time for monitoring. And it, I do not know of a death yet. There could have been one that we just, I'm not aware of. But it, it's, it overwhelmingly results in a person recovering from this after the hospitalization and their release. And then it's basically treated with anti-inflammatories and, and, and uh, systemic support. <laughs> and now, if you start looking at the age groups here, um, now this right now is the two vaccines. They, it occurs with both vaccines, although we're getting more data on Moderna. But look, this is male and female, okay? And you see now that the rates in young males are much higher. And it's much higher after those two. All right, so if, and, and this again is, let me look to make sure I'm saying this correctly, per 1 million dose. So let's look at this highest rate here. Let's just say that's 70. So that's 70 per million, seven per 100,000. Now we're in the one per 12,000 range. Okay, that is more frequent than you'd like to see. Um, we took a um, vaccine off the market back in late 1990s, the first rotavirus vaccine that was causing intussusception at a rate of about one per 20. And that was a non-fatal complication as well. All right, so 
my advice to young men is you might consider getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and consider carefully if you can watch carefully if you don't, even though it's one per 12,000, that's, I mean, those are still pretty good odds. You're not going to get this, but it's, we can't say it doesn't happen. And the interesting thing is this hasn't been confirmed yet in our vaccine safety data link system, because even though we're looking at 9 million people, um, we're not, we're, we haven't, it, it hasn't been used enough in that system to pick this up yet. It's still a pretty rare event, um, but let's be transparent about it and say it does, it, we do think this is occurring as a result of next. All right, so summary in the United States, in my opinion, we have a very secure supply of safe vaccines. We have a transparent method of making vaccine recommendations. We have a very robust system for monitoring vaccine safety. I would put out the challenge to show me any other medical product, biological, that is subject to this much surveillance regarding safety. And we have a system to compensate those who experience a rare but serious adverse reaction to the vaccine. Now, with the caveat that we're gonna see how well that system works um, with these COVID vaccines and using the CICP. All right, I am now open for any questions um, with about 10 minutes left to go for anybody might have or that you might pose for me that came in from the question bank. Thank you so much. I have uh, several questions for you as the moderator and participants. Again, uh, type any questions or comments that you have into the q and I have, uh, my first question is, is a couple of questions for you about politics. You mentioned towards the beginning of your presentation and I didn't quite catch all of it. You said something about the election impacting when the EUA was going to be released. Can you if approved? Can you repeat that? Yeah, the the conditions that the commissioner of the FDA, the Secretary of Health, put that that they stated that they would have to meet before approving a vaccine for use through an EUA, may, based on when the trial started, the number of people enrolled in so forth, it made it impossible to approve the use of the vaccine prior to the election. Oh, and I think, okay. it's, I think it's safe to say that the prior administration would have very much liked to have seen a vaccine approved for use prior to the election. Oh, okay, I see. You mentioned uh, early on in your presentation, you listed off all of those different people who were either on AKIP or uh, providing input in some of the process. I'm curious, uh, if politics plays a part at all. I mean, obviously many of those people are very knowledgeable and have quite a bit of evidence as it relates to science, but how do you balance that with the politics of having a committee with, with all of these people who have so many different uh, opinions and stakes in it? Well, it depends on what you call politics. Um, for instance, you know, how did I become the liaison from the American Academy of Family Physicians? Well, you know, there's some internal you know, personal politics that goes on and, and so forth. Um, how did I get picked to be nominated to be a member of ACIP? Once again, it's like I served for a liaison for five years. The CDC staff got to know me. Um, they, they felt comfortable with me and they nominated. The, the administration at the time wasn't particularly concerned about uh, about who was being nominated to be on ACIP. Now take back in the George Bush administration, I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the anti-vaccine criticism was coming from the political right now at that time. Now it comes from both the left and the right. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not picking on one side or the other, but, but they, were, they were sympathetic and they appointed three people to ACIP that the, that, that the CDC had not nominated. And one of those, was a, a executive of an autism support group, okay? And, and that was a very, like I say, a very interesting four year period of time. I think it was very educational for that person. Um, and I think they came out with a different view of the way decisions are made than they were in with. And I've seen that happen many times. 
Uh, and in fact, I think that's a great thing to do. If you have somebody criticizing your process, make them a member <laughs> and let them see it work for the inside. I've seen that work several times. Um, you know, the, I was the, on the advisory board for the National Health Service Corp uh, for four years. And right prior to my ter term there, it had been a person appointed very, very anti-government involvement in medicine. And, and they were going to go in and reform the National Health Service Corp. And over a four-year period of time, they made a series of visits to community health centers, talked to National Health Service Corps, and came out one of the strongest supporters of the system that you could imagine, because they, they got to see how it actually worked. Um, and and I, so I think that's, that's a good thing to do here and there, uh, is to put in somebody who's not that supportive, and let's just let them see how the system works for a while. Wow, and that's so amazing. I, that's... Yeah, okay, so I, I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> No, no, it does. It's it's fascinating, and I think it's a really good point. Whenever people talk about conspiracy theories, I think about how complex the government really is, and how many people are involved, and how hard it is to keep a secret. And, and if people were really involved in the process, I think that they uh, think very, very differently, as you said. Yeah. So I think that Tara said that she had a question. We have just a couple minutes left. I also want to give my thanks for what a, a very helpful overview of where we've been and how vaccine approval works in America. I was hoping to get your thoughts on going forward as we are likely going to continue to see more variants with COVID, um, what you think may be happening with, well, two thoughts with both um, Americans continuing to receive vaccines through boosters or maybe other means, and also um, you know, vaccine hesitancy, which um, has stayed actually steady throughout this whole um, ordeal. Uh, anyway, I'd love your thoughts on both of those. Okay, I'm happy to predict with the caveat that you understand I've been wrong about every particular point. <laughs> you will not bet on your prediction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I think that uh, we are, this, this, this vaccine is looking, I mean, sorry, this virus is looking more and more like influenza in terms of its constant mutating all the time. I would not be at all surprised if we got down to having an annual COVID vaccine um, that with the different antigens in it based on what was the predominant circulating strain at that point in time. That's what we do with influenza every year because um, it mutates you know, little by little and then makes major jumps every so often. And we try to predict what the, what the circulating strains are going to be. And those are the strains that are included in the vaccine every year. I, I would not be at all surprised if that's what we got to with COVID. Um, and once the disease calms down, we get enough immunity through vaccine and people infected. And the number of deaths, you know, I don't, I don't think the public concern is going to be there, unforced. Um, and I think we'll kind of get to a situation like we have with flu vaccine, where you, you talk about when you've got older adults who are very concerned about their health and who predominantly are the ones dying, they'll get vaccinated at pretty high rates. <clears throat> um, the younger ages probably won't. Um, they don't now with flu. Uh, and, you know, people will make individual decisions. I always talk about flu or not, uh, not flu, but vaccines as being an intergenerational consideration. If you want to prevent flu in your grandparent, the best thing to do is immunize their grandkids because they'll bring home flu from school and give it to the grandparents. We know that from uh, pneumonias and other things that <clears throat> grandkids pass things on to grandparents. <clears throat> um, and in addition, if you want to protect newborns, the best thing to do is vaccinate the pregnant woman. So it's, inter, it's intergenerational, it's a family thing. It's not, a, it's not necessarily an individual thing. Getting the American public to consider vaccines as a communal benefit, I don't have much hope for. Um, I think Americans are very individualistic and they'll look at it and assess it from an individualistic viewpoint. What's it mean for me and my family? And um, do I wanna take that risk? I think that we'll continue to see overblown um, statements regarding vaccine safety, meaning that it's, that it's not as safe as, as you know, I, we see that now. We see all kinds of exaggerations and misinformation regarding vaccine safety. 
Some of it is people just not understanding the numbers that they're looking at. Some of it, I think, has malintent. And what their motives are, I just don't. And I think we'll continue to see that. I don't see that going away. And what will change all of it? Well, a, a much worse pandemic. <laughs> if, if, COVID, if COVID was killing one out of every 10 people that infected, rather than one out of every 100 or out of every 200, we wouldn't have these problems. <clears throat> um, if it were highly infectious and killed 10% of those that infected or higher, um, you'll see a marked change in that. <clears throat> but the COVID pandemic, while it's been bad, hasn't been quite bad enough. Um, because on an individual basis, when you get COVID, chances are really good, you'll do fine. And that people in your family will do fine. You may have an older person die, you may have a younger person die, but not at very high rates. <laughs> and when it comes to it, the number, you know, one per 50, one per 60, one per 100, um, that's just not high enough for most, because most people don't appreciate those numbers. And they, you know, an anecdote, oh, I got COVID and I did just fine, you know? Uh, and everybody I know did just fine. Well, that will that will trump epidemiological. I, I don't want to use the word trump. Sorry, that will overrule any um, analysis that they might be presented regarding overall community wide morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Those are all those are all really good points. I think that it is hard for our human brains to really visualize numbers. I know I have so many more follow up questions and we actually have two questions in the chat, but it is a, a couple minutes after one o'clock right now. So I would like to go ahead and, and wrap up in the interest of respecting everybody's time. Uh, but, you know, those of you who have questions in the chat, feel free to send Doug or, or one of us an email afterward. Um, I'm sure that, that people would like to hear more from you. We really appreciate your time. And I had no idea that, that the process was as complex as it is. Yeah, you know, my final word is, if you study the system from an open-minded perspective, you'll come away pretty confident. In it. And you'll also come away realizing that, you know, there are, there are some potential adverse reactions that can occur. They're just not very common. But let's not say they don't exist. Let's just point out how common they are, how, what that we can do to avoid them to the extent possible, um, and what the benefits are. Because we need to start talking about the benefits. When you're presenting 95% of illness and death and hospitalization, I mean, the benefits far exceed any ad. It's, they're just occurring to different people. <laughs> you know? So, um, and again, it's hard for society to come to grips with. Yeah, I think that's hard for people to, hard for all of us to conceptualize, which is why it's so important to trust the experts like yourself. Well, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up again. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, and yeah, thank you for everybody who, who attended and, and for our students who are watching live or um, watching the video afterwards.